Okay, hello and welcome to the webinar on From the Home to the Landscape. I love seeing where everybody's uh, listening in from. It seems like we have a good representation from around Oregon, but also across the United States, which is pretty fantastic. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Carrie Berger and I'm your host and manager of Oregon State University's Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Fire Program. This webinar is part of a webinar series meant to help prepare uh, Oregonians and anyone actually calling in for wildfire season. Today, we will review practical steps you and your neighbors can take before fire season. Overall, the webinar series aims to address preparedness at three levels, and that's the individual, community, and the landscape. Coming up, we'll also talk about building community for wildfire resilience. Um, we'll have a session on Ready, Set, Go. We'll talk about fire on the landscape, both in terms of fire ecology and fire behavior. Then of course, what to do or expect when a fire hits. And our last session will cover recovery after a fire. So it's our intention to provide broad level information in these webinars and then provide local online meetings that will dial this information in for your area or county. And because you signed up for this webinar, you will receive information for those area specific meetings. So stay tuned and feel free to visit the online webinar guide for updates. Um, okay, before we begin the presentations, I have some webinar logistics that I'd like to quickly cover. This session is being recorded and all webinar recordings can be found on the Forestry and Natural Resource Extension YouTube channel. We are also streaming live on the Extension's Facebook page. Today I'm trying out something new and it's the closed captioning feature and so hopefully you are all seeing that at the bottom of your screens. Now, if you don't want to see the captioning, simply go to live transcript, which is at the bottom uh, part of your screen there, and then click on hide subtitles. Um, for the people tuning into the webinar on Zoom, your audio has been muted. If you are having uh, audio troubles and are connected to your computer's audio, I suggest just simply hanging up and dialing in with your phone. You can always post a question in the chat window if you are having technical difficulties. Um, but if you have a question on the information that is being presented, please type your uh, question in the Q&A window. We, we have limited time, but we will do our best to answer your questions live here today. And if you don't catch all the information presented, don't worry. I'll provide all the resources and links mentioned during the webinar on our FIRE program website and I'll even follow up with an email just to be sure that you get that information. Okay, so let's get the webinar started. I want to first introduce Glenn Ahrens. Glenn is our moderator today and is the Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Agent in Clackamas, Hood River, and Marion Counties. Our presenters today are Kara Baylog and John Rizza. Kara is a Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Program Coordinator and John Rizza is one of our new Extension Fire Specialists serving Northeast Oregon. We also have panelists on the line to assist with questions, including some from the new Extension Fire Program team and Amy Jo Detweiler, who is the Community Horticulturist for uh, Oregon State University Extension in Central Oregon. Welcome everybody. And Carol, when you're ready, go ahead. Thanks so much, Carrie. really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joining in. Um, I really appreciate having your time and hopefully we'll have a good webinar while you're eating lunch. So first, I wanna start off with an acknowledgement. Uh, wildfire can be a traumatic experience for those who survive them. For those of you who are joining us now who have lost homes due to wildfire, you have our condolences for your difficult time. This next series of slides will be showing images of embers showering homes and structures. Um, these Im images will help to highlight effective strategies for being fire prepared, but we invite you to take a break from the screen if you need to and listen, as we'll be explaining our points for anyone who doesn't or can't view the presentation. So please feel free to do that. So I want to start off with talking about how homes burn so we can get into the what we can do about it later on. 
We'll be asking you a quick poll question here on this topic in a moment on what you think is the number one reason for homes or structures to burn in a wildfire. So get your thinking caps on. Uh, quick intro, we see homes burn down generally in one of three ways. First off, we've got burning embers. And this is when embers that are given off from a wildfire float over to the home and are able to ignite it. Secondly, we have direct flame contact, and this is exactly what it sounds like, where the fire comes right up to the house and ignites the house in that way. And thirdly, we have radiant heat. So this is where the heat from the fire is so intense, it causes the off-gassing from the house to simply ignite, even though there's no direct flame contact. So at this point, we're going to have in the chat, I believe, uh, a poll of these three things, which do you think is the number one culprit for causing homes in a wildfire to burn down. And I'll give everyone a, a minute or so on that. Wow, you guys are voting very quickly. <laughs> All right, looks like we're slowing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Um, but overwhelmingly, we see folks having voted for embers at 89%, direct flame for at 4%, and radiation at 17%. I wanna say the embers have it. Um, yes, so those of you who select embers, you're right. Uh, over 90% of homes, depending on the wildfire, but over 90% of homes that do burn down in a wildfire are the direct result of embers. So let's talk a little bit about why. How can something so small be responsible for so much damage? The problem comes in, a, in that there are so many of them. They've got strength in numbers. Um, embers can travel far, even up to a mile, given worst wind conditions. And when they collect, they can set off fuel that's, that is your home, uh, like heart, hot charcoal can in a brush pile. So uh, just to note, the links for the longer version of these videos are up in the research packet. I highly recommend you take a look at it. It's a, about a five minute video, but it's really worthwhile to just understand how this happens. Embers collect. Um, so we, we need to watch out for embers collecting in things like roof valleys and gutters. A good rule of thumb is anywhere that leaves and other debris are able to collect in a wildfire, embers will also collect. So we can see, so for example, in these videos where embers have collected in the gutters, they've been able to ignite the roofing and the siding as a result. It's even easier, easier for these embers to turn flame to turn into flame when the leaves and debris in these uh, structures, so the gutters, the roof valleys, are dry and hot in the summer. So one and watch out for those. Wind and embers make a terrifying partnership. When you get embers stuck in corners like this, wind can come in and create mini tornado-like effects, breathing oxygen into burning embers and allowing them to ignite the home material very quickly and very violently. Not all ignition takes place outside of the home. Of course, we need vents and eaves and things like that on our home, but this also provides a convenient place for embers to enter and ignite dry roofing from the inside out. So we can see the ember shower hitting this particular house and the embers just flying right into the roof. This is especially true with larger openings. Uh, John's gonna get more into this in a bit, but the key is to keep these embers out as best as possible. Sometimes this is as simple as providing physical barriers. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to John Reason. Thanks, Kara. That was awesome. I really appreciate your use of those um, materials to help demonstrate the points we're trying to make. And we just have a couple more slides to finish up with this particular section. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about how can we make our home a little bit more ember prepared. And, and that's what we're going to talk about for just a minute here. There's no such thing as being ember proof, as Kara indicated. There's lots of venting and different things in our homes. Um, but we really want to try and emphasize the point that these flying embers, while they may not um, burn the trees around your home, which you can see in this photo on the left, they can get into places in your home and ignite that structure. Uh, and so whatever we can do to reduce that impact is going to help us uh, with our housing. And then on the right hand side here, you see 
uh, a shake wood roof uh, anywhere out in the back country and just in general shake wood roofs are typically not the best kind of situation for us here in this example. Here's a, a little bit more about the strategies that we can employ to make our homes a little bit more amber prepared. Uh, and, and in this diagram, this is from that video that Carol was talking about with the amber showers. On the right hand side, this is a home hardened house with all the prescriptions that are recommended that we're gonna get into uh, and, and alterations in the construction components. And on the left side is a, a regular standard home with cedar siding and uh, other, you know, combustible materials surrounding the home. So we're gonna get in a little bit more about that. And then we're also gonna talk about creating and maintaining adequate defensible space uh, so that we can help you guys with this process here. So we've gone through this time period of active fire uh, and the talk is kind of over with that portion. I just wanna take a quick break to invite you to look out the window before we move to the next section or, or take a second to regroup, grab a sip of water, which I'm gonna do as well. So let's talk a little bit about some ways to harden your home. I'm just gonna briefly touch on a few things that are effective and things that you should consider, but we really wanna be looking at all the different aspects of the home from the roof all the way to the foundation. And these really detailed pieces can be found in the home retrofit guide that's on your resources list on the main website uh, where we're talking about um, all the different aspects and they really dive into each piece. I'm just gonna really quickly show an example. So let's start with the roof. Um, there are different roofing actual systems that you can put in place that increase your chances and, and create non-combustible materials. Additionally, a really simple one is just every spring to and, and during the fire season to keep your uh, roof really well uh, cleaned off and avoid any sort of accumulation of combustible materials. If we get this stuff out of the valley, there's gonna be nothing on that roof to catch. Additionally, as you saw in that diagram earlier, the gutters, your eaves, your soffits, there's some really good details in that guide I just showed you, and I'm not gonna go over all those in this presentation. Just kind of wanted to zoom in on the screening thing that Kara mentioned earlier. It's amazing what a, a quarter inch to eighth inch screen can help you do for protecting how the embers get inside your structure. And so really looking at what that needs to look like. Additionally, it provides some great rodent protection. So those eighth inch metal screens that are non-combustible can really help you out in a multitude of ways. Not everybody's gonna go ahead and, and get new siding that's non-combustible or put new windows and skylights in, but these are examples. If you are doing a, a, an upgrade on your home to you know, create good flashing and, and good uh, construction of those windows using good double pane windows uh, to help reduce any issue there. Um, and additionally, um, this diagram, this comes directly out of that guide I, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, is really important to look at how we're constructing on our decks uh, and the interaction between our deck and the siding of our home. And then additionally, that ember resistant footprint underneath where we're gonna really reduce any sort of combustible materials underneath the home. So some other things that we wanna consider, do you have a carport? There's lots of nooks and crannies in a carport that's exposed. And so what does that look like? And do we have it set up properly? You can see here in this diagram on the lower left side, the garage door, uh, there's a big gap in the weather stripping. Is that just needing some tightening of the track for the garage door? Or at the bottom here, the weather stripping is actually not creating a good gap along the ground. And so do we need to replace that weather stripping or can we adjust that door so we can keep those embers from going inside the structure? Um, up in the upper right-hand corner here, we see a, a frame that's got some rot going on and that's a really easy place for embers to accumulate right in the corners here you have a good metal door but if the door frame isn't going to keep the embers away um, there's no point in having a good fire resistant door so um, really important to actually come in and get this rock cut out of here cleaned up and put a nice fresh coat of paint on that get it caulked and sealed well this is a really pretty extreme example down here in the right hand corner but we want to consider all the different pieces and of the puzzle here and understand what the hazards are. And you know, we know that pesticides can create a pretty significant hazard 
for ourselves, our family, and additionally, any sort of emergency service personnel who may be in the area um, during this wildfire situation. So um, let's just do what we can to you know, address these kinds of situations, put these materials in a proper storage unit, put them inside, closed up, uh, or away from the home in a, a good structure that's labeled so, so firefighters and others who are there can know to just stay away from that particular area. So there's kind of two ways to look at this here. We got the more passive way, which is what we've talked about, some of these home hardening principles. Um, basically, what can we do to help our home deal with a wildfire without any sort of outside intervention? And then there's the more active way where we're gonna look at um, if firefighters do arrive, how are they gonna have a good chance for success? And we're gonna talk about that just real briefly. Um, but that's basically creating that defensible space that's attractive to emergency personnel. Um, Jack Cohen's a guy who's worked for the Forest Service and is now retired for a lot of years and did a bunch of research on this over time and talked about all the opportunities that we have as homeowners um, to take care of the little things around our house to keep our home from igniting. I thought that was a really great quote from the video and that video is, is in your resource guide on the website. Um, and just real quick to touch on what he's looking at here, um, these are needles and leaves accumulated against the house. And then here you can see that lattice work underneath the home. And this is a place where we wanna clean that stuff all out every spring and then look at what we can do to adjust that lattice so that we don't have the opportunity for embers to get into or within our structure. All right, so the three home ignition zones are how we're gonna kind of break this thing down after our home. We talked about from the roof to the foundation, now we're gonna go out from there. The home ignition zone serves as a guide to help you create an effective defensible space around your home. And this is a, a really good thing to kind of start implementing. And people always ask me, well, where do I start? How do I get started? Start with the simple stuff, find the low hanging fruit. If you have a, an issue on your home and you know you can make that adjustment, go ahead and get that done. Uh, if there's things you can work your way, what I suggest is you start at the home and kind of work your way out from there. And so what that looks like is the immediate zone is zero to five feet. So that's creating an ember resistant envelope around your house. And then the intermediate zone is the five to 30 feet. We're gonna say, we're gonna keep that lean, clean and green. Y'all probably heard that phrase a bunch of times. Um, it's a really good thing to look at here. And what we can do is, is to do that. And I'm going to get into each one of these a little more in depth. And then our extended home ignition zone is kind of that 30 and beyond area where we're looking at. And I'm going to say it, we thin, prune, and separate in that area. So we're going to get a little more in depth to each one of those pieces uh, as we go through this um, situation here. So. So in the immediate home ignition zone, we wanna again, maintain a non-combustible kind of envelope around our house. Let's look at the rock, gravel, concrete, pavers, different things that are non-combustible. Um, in this, like for example, on the upper right hand side, this is good, you know, rock and all, but there's opportunities for combustible material to accumulate in the rock wall. And so we wanna take our leaf blower every so often and clean this stuff out, um, make sure we don't have any accumulation of combustible material. Here's a really nice paper patio and I'll give myself a little credit here. I, I laid this for a homeowner in a project I was working on uh, and it really creates a good defensible space. There's nowhere uh, that any sort of combustible material is up against this house. And there's a shop on the right hand side of this picture. Uh, and we did the same kind of thing there and then created that lean green space around on the outside of that. Uh, but then one last picture, just kind of showing the ability to take combustible materials away from the home. And it doesn't have to be ugly. This is a nice picture here with some good rock mulch up against the house. So consider some of the other opportunities where fuels may be near your home. And a lot of times fences are a really uh, important place to look at for that. Um, so we go from a standard wood slap fence and then we transition to a non-combustible material. This may be metal or something of that nature that's close up against the house. Uh, that, that's a really good way to kind of transition up there if you need to have a fencing material up against your home. Lawn furniture can be metal at times, but then we put these nice fluffy cushions because I want to sit on a fluffy cushion uh, that can be a good place for embers to accumulate. So let's go ahead and put that cushion away if there's an issue. 
And then doormats are another really interesting place like we talked about with the door frames. Those doormats can also accumulate those mulches just like you, or excuse me, embers, just like you would get your, your you know, grass and, and leaves to accumulate around those places. So in the lower left-hand corner, there's a picture of a, an example home here. And I'm gonna pick on this house just a little bit. Can you identify a few things that maybe you could implement to help you be a little more effective with your preparedness? Well, I see a couple things right off the bat. The firewood pile. While this is great in the wintertime, in the summertime, let's keep those firewood piles, lumber piles, propane tanks, gas cans, all that kind of material away from the structure. Have a nice shed. Uh, away from the house that, that you can store all that stuff in so that we don't have anywhere that embers can get in and, and potentially start a fire. Um, and then I look at the deck situation here as well. Make sure we want to clean all that footprint out and put non-combustible rock underneath there. And that's where we can look at maybe installing that eighth inch screen opportunity as well to help keep any opportunities of embers getting underneath there. All right, so we're gonna now transition to our intermediate zone, which is that five to 30 foot. We should say again, it's keep it lean, clean, and green. Just gonna go over real briefly a couple things. There's so many materials on the website that'll help you really dial this in. Um, but we can see around this uh, home in the upper right-hand corner, they space those trees out. Um, they're using a rule of thumb about 18 feet everybody's going to have a little different. The bigger your trees are, the bigger your spacing you want to be. Um, but the gist of the deal here is that we got some clumps of trees that are spaced out. They're limbed up. So we reduce the connection between the surface fuels and the crown fuels in the tree. We want to, you know, the rule of thumb is kind of about three times the height. If I have grass underneath that tree and I can walk underneath it, I'm not quite six feet, but if I can comfortably walk underneath it, I think we're in a pretty good place. Um, the taller your shrubs underneath, the higher you want to go there. Um, and then cleaning up your fallen needles, materials, leaves every spring. Right now is a really good time to kind of get that stuff out of there. Um, you can additionally, and you can see in the picture on the left-hand side here, there is a, uh, a shrub bed. Uh, you know, we use rock mulch here in the shrub bed and then planted these shrubs, spaced them out a little bit. Kara's going to go into a little bit more on the plant material, so I'm not going to touch on that, but uh, you see what's going on in that photo. Now for me, on this kind of past this intermediate zone, which maybe is marked by the fence here, uh, we're gonna get into the extended zone and talk a little bit about it, but what do you see here? I see some more ladder fuels than I might want. I see some more uh, tightly uh, grown trees than maybe I might want um, close to my house. And so on that extended zone, this is that 30 to 100 foot minimum. If you live on a slope, you might increase that all the way to your property boundary at the minimum, but 200 feet or more would be a great way to kind of consider that if you have a slope so that those fuels have an opportunity to get further away. What we're really looking at doing here is thinning, pruning, separating our ground fuels from our uh, fuels up in our canopy. And we can do this by selecting vigorously healthy growing plants uh, to remain behind. We really want to get rid of those ladder fuels. So limb those plants up, go ahead and get rid of all the brush underneath and the lower limbs. Um, you can see in this picture, we have some chipping happening by our crew. You can disperse those chips on the site. We don't want them to get too thick. Um, and we, again, want to keep them away from that closer zone to the home if we don't have a way to dispose of those chips. Uh, we recommend staying less than four inches in depth um, but we can also leave other down logs, dead trees, brush piles for quail habitat, improve your soil condition, different things like that. And we don't want fuel everywhere all over the place, um, but we can have some out there um, to remain behind. This picture in the, actually in the lower left-hand corner, this is, this is my personal home. Um, and this is a photo from last summer when we had a fire just a few miles away on the ridge. Um, and I, I really like this photo because it was really interesting, but this is not the time to be thinking about reducing my fuels out in, in my extended home ignition zone. Um, I've been working real hard trying to get these junipers cut down, create a buffer around the house. And this was kind of before, I don't really have a good after picture, um, but we've done a ton of spacing. We've reduced the fuels, we've kept shrubs out there. I've got a lot more work to do, um, but these are things that are gonna take time. You can't get this all done in one sleep um, right away but we really can work hard on trying to implement this, these practices so that we can create a more um, 
fire prepared property. So after sharing this personal experience, I just want to invite you to take a quick second to stretch your limbs and your eyes before we move on to the final section. And I'm going to grab a drink of water while I'm at it. Okay, thank you. So let's consider emergency responder access. What is the number one priority? Firefighter safety above all. I know there's lots of different slogans and all, but we got to think about these are our brothers, our sisters, our, our aunts and uncles that are out there fighting these fires, and we want everyone to be home safe at the end of the day. So what can we do on our properties that kind of give them a safe spot if they're out there and they notice something and they think they can handle it? Um, well, we can ensure that our home and our neighborhood have clearly marked um, signage, street names, and numbers that are reflective. A lot of times these folks are out here in the dark or there's smoke. Um, in this picture right here, I personally wouldn't have put that uh, mailbox in, in the sign. I would maybe put the mailbox behind the sign or, you know, something so that that sign can be seen from either direction of travel really, really clearly. I want to do the best thing. And a lot of communities have these signs kind of already set up and you can call them and ask them what they're doing and, and then just get those signs produced that are very similar to what everybody else has. We also want to provide good access in the driveways, 12 foot wide minimum and 15 foot tall uh, vertically is, is a really good clearance pathway. If you've ever been in a fire truck or a big truck coming down, get a load of gravel from a dump truck and see all the stuff he hits when he's backing in your driveway. Uh, it's, it's pretty telling of what the fire truck might be dealing with when they're coming in and they're just going to keep going if that's the situation. We always want to bring this up that Evacuate if you feel it's unsafe to stay. Don't wait for this emergency notification or for somebody to come in and tell you it's time to go. It's really important that we make sure we're responsible for our safety and we don't expect anybody to come in and, and do anything that's gonna put their lives in jeopardy. So grab what you gotta go and you'll talk about that more down the road here with other webinars we're offering about your go bag and different things like that. Um, for now, Kara is gonna kind of touch on some of the fire resistant plants. Thanks, John. So yeah, now we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that not all vegetation is equal in the eyes of wildfire. Um, being conscientious about what type of vegetation we have close to the home and which types of plants we exclude, we can improve our chances that our homes will survive. Fire resistant plants can play a great role here. In addition to being more difficult to catch fire, fire resistant plants can also serve as a barrier to radiative heat coming from a wildfire. So consider using things like fire resistant trees in your uh, intermediate zone in particular. So that five to 30 foot uh, zone. So actually, John, can you put it back <laughs> a second? Uh, so this, uh, this photo is sort of an example of that where it's got some what I think are, are aspens um, blocking that radiative heat from the house. So it can actually improve your chances to have vegetation sometimes. Okay, now we'll go to that next bit. Um, before I get into the bits and pieces of what show a fire resistant plant, I want to just warn you, fire resistant does not mean fireproof. Um, any vegetation can still catch fire given the right circumstances, given you know, strong winds, lots of heat, um, but fire resistant plants are going to take longer to catch. So and it's going to require more embers, for example, more direct flame to get them to catch. So they're going to improve your chances, but again, they still can technically catch fire. So now I'm going to get into the qualities and characteristics of what makes the plant more or less likely to burn. I'm not going to go too deeply into the specific plants here and there. My goal is to help you determine if the plant is likely to burn or not, even if you don't know what that plant is. Um, I'm not a master gardener myself, so uh, you would probably be able to get a list of good plants from any master gardener much better than I. Um, and I would like to note that we have uh, Amy Jo here in the Q&A, and as, the, as an OSU Extension horticulturist, she's an expert. So any questions that you might have on specific plants, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A chat function. Um, she'll also be putting a webinar in July on this specific topic, so please consider registering for that class. The details of that class are in your resource packet. So fire resistant plants are really great at retaining water water, of course, reducing the chance that the plant is going to burn. Telltale signs are that the leaves are supple and moist. Um, these plants are healthy and they don't accumulate a lot of dead material easily. 
And your actions can play a role here, of course, um, by keeping plants well watered, by pruning them of dead material when, when it occurs, you can improve the chance that they're not going to catch and thereby protect your home as well. Uh, sap is another good telltale sign. When the sap is less sticky or thick, when it's really watery and there's not really a lot of it, um, that is an indication that, that the plant is a little more fire resistant. Some good examples of fire resistant plants are maples, oak trees, and you'll note those are deciduous trees that lose their, tr their leaves in the winter. So that's another telltale sign. It's a common characteristic of fire resistant plants, although not always. Um, but also you have plants like rhododendrons that don't lose their leaves, which are also very fire resistant, um, or things like ground cover, like hen and chicks. And we have, again, in, our, in the resource packet, we've got links to um, a wonderful publication actually written by Amy Jo and others uh, on several different fire, uh, fire resistant plants. So again, I encourage you to take a look at that list and go through. You don't have to have an ugly landscape just because you have a fire resistant landscape. Let's go to the next slide now. On the other hand, fire prone plants have a lot more dead material. Um, and this can be because the plant just naturally grows and dies back, grows and dies back. So, you know, for example, Himalayan blackberry is a really good example of this where every year they grow and then some parts of them die back. And those dead parts are really good at igniting. Um, Juniper is another great example. Um, this can also be a situation where uh, the plants are just unhealthy. So where you have a plant that's technically fire resistant, but it's just not getting taken care of and has parts of it die, that plant has lost its fire resistance and it could actually become more fire prone. Um, so plants with a lot more resinous sap, uh, leaves or needles are also going to be more fire prone. You can usually figure this out too um, if there's a strong odor in the sap. But don't be confused with a strong odor by the plant um, from the sap as you know, like a flavorful herbaceous herb like basil. Your basil is fine. Your basil is not uh, fire prone. Um, and obviously, if the plant lights easily, it's going to be more fire prone as well. So good examples of this uh, are number one uh, common villain is the, your junipers. You want to keep those away. Cypress are another one. Unfortunately, they're really fast growing and a lot of people really like to use them for privacy purposes, but on the other hand, they are really fire prone. Um, on the east side, cheatgrass is another big one. And, and I know that's not really something that people intentionally put into their yards, but if it's there anyway, uh, it can be a problem. And Himalayan blackberry, of course, are, is another example of that. Those are all common villains to wildfire resist, resilience, um, but there, of course, there's plenty more. Um, so if you have those around your home, especially in the immediate zone, that five foot around your home area, please consider removing them completely. Um, I know there's some plants like rosemary. Everyone loves to have rosemary because it's such a great herb to cook with. It is more on the fire prone side. So if you want to have plants like that, just keep it out of the immediate zone. Um, maybe in the intermediate zone or even in the extended zone, keeping it well watered, keeping it um, clear from other vegetation. So if it does catch fire, it's not going to convey that fuel. Uh, but especially around that immediate zone, especially around places like your windows, where fire is uh, going to really easily convey and the radiative heat is going to break windows and allow more embers to fly in, please consider just removing them completely. Um, again, uh, OSU Master Gardeners um, with Amy Jo, are, they're going to be putting on a full class on this on July 13th, so please feel free to, to sign up for that. It's going to be an excellent class. So let's go to the next slide here. Uh, so we're going to turn it back to you again, uh, have a little bit of interaction. Um, so based on all that we've talked about, including what, what John Reza has talked about and I have talked about, we'd like to learn from you what your actions are going to be going forward from this day out. So go ahead, go to menti.com. Um, there's an app as well that you can use and input this code 53085852. And let's go ahead and, and see what you're planning to do before fire season. And uh, I'm gonna turn that over to John to organize this. Yep, great. So we'll give people another quick second. And if you have a camera phone, you just put your camera up to the QR code on the right side and then click the button and it'll bring you to that. So I'm gonna try and transition here to that. Please bear with me for just a half a second while I do this. 
I also put the link in the chat box with the code. Thanks, Glenn. Sorry, this is always a little clunkier when you do it in real life, but there we go. So you can see all the really great stuff coming up here. Um, I think there's a, hopefully we gave you just a, a real quick touch on some of the different actions you can take. And I like that clean. I think that's a really inexpensive, easy thing to do. Get your spring cleaning done inside and outside your home. Um, I saw collaborative in there for a minute or two. So that's a good one. Um, you know, there's a ton of different things we can put into here. Uh, this, obviously people like the removing the fuels thing because so the bigger the word the more people have put into it so i really appreciate y'all having that input on this um yes this is pretty expensive stuff and so i'm trying to figure out a pathway and prioritizing so that you can you know get some treatments done over time and again we kind of mentioned how do we prioritize well we're going to start with the low-hanging fruit and kind of work our way out so we start kind of close to the house and move our way out and then um you know, with our, our home hardening part, we can do the same kind of thing. What, what can we do for, you know, putting fresh paint up there that's not peeling and cracking and, and, you know, putting caulk up that, you know, gives us the opportunity to, to clean those different joints up, um, you know, checking our weather ceiling on all our doors and, and getting our windows clean so they close proper and, and are latchable. Um, additionally, cleaning off those, um, you know, roofs and the gutters and the valleys and all the different places that material just, you know, get set up on the home um, and making sure that when we do some sort of retrofitting, we're properly flashing, we're properly trimming it out and sealing everything up really well. So uh, great. Well, that was an awesome exercise. I really appreciate y'all. I'm going to kind of let that thing go for a minute and we'll, we'll take a picture of that and, and save it for later so that we have all your data collected. And I'll go ahead and uh, put the last little few slides up here for us um, to go through. Yeah, and when there. when John says we're collecting your data, he just means your answers. We're, we're, <laughs> we're not getting creepy there. Um, so yeah, I, I was really excited to see your responses and I'm really encouraged that everyone is planning to do something around their house, especially those things like cleaning out gutters. These are small, low hanging fruits that can have huge impacts. Um, but I do wanna keep in mind, plants grow back, dead leaves and needles reaccumulate in gutters. So this is not something that is a one and done. We have to come back to it um, every year. So as part of your resources packet, we've included um, some checklists that you can use every year throughout the winter and the spring. And, and those checklists are slightly different between the two seasons, just because what you can do is different. Um, so if you've already um, started doing some of the work, great, but we'd also like you to take a look at the checklist um, and sort of figure out what else you can do. So I'm just gonna really quickly go through what some of those things are. So for example, during, during the winter, that's the ideal time to really be going through and seeing what has grown back that I had already put, um, that I'd already cut back before. So in particular, we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, limbs that are overhanging, that have grown, um, especially near the, the structures, uh, you're gonna wanna look at your driveway. So what has grown over the past year in your driveway that would make it more difficult for a fire engine to come through if they had to, or for you to evacuate if you had to. Um, consider again, those the sign that you have. Um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to assess is your sign really visible in the winter? So you might wanna do that also in the spring just because vegetation grows around it. And in the winter when there's fewer leaves, it might seem like it's a little bit easier to see. Um, definitely go and regularly maintain that 100 feet plus away um, from your home, the defensible space area. Um, go ahead and look, have trees and shrubs started uh, growing around power lines or electric fences. So this might even be outside of that area, that defensible space area. Um, but you're still going to want to pay attention to it because those are places that can convey fire. And in general, just maintain the separation of fuels, you know, the trees, the shrubs in your defensible space zone. Come spring, this is going to be the time that you can do things like remove those firewood piles. So in the winter, not so important, but in the springtime, you definitely want to get those firewood piles away from your home. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you're keeping your lawn mowed as long as that, mo that lawn is still green. So once the lawn dies, if you're not irrigating the lawn and it's further out, um, 
you want to, you don't want to vote anymore because then you're, you have the uh, opportunity to ignite that, that dead grass. But for the lawn that you irrigate and anything up to that 30 feet away should be irrigated. Make sure you're constantly mowing it to four inches or less. Um, take a look for, again, for weeds, you know, springtime's a great time for those weeds to really bounce back up. Um, this would be the time to start thinking about what am I going to do if a fire comes with my patio furniture? So exactly like John was talking about, you know, these comfortable pillows that we might like to keep on our patio furniture, those are great at burning and conveying fire. So have a plan to bring those things inside if a fire is coming or have them inside to begin with and only take them out when you're gonna use them. And, and this is also a good time to uh, take a look at your evacuation plan. And, and we're gonna have future webinars that delve more deeply into this, but just uh, keep a dog ear, you know, um, keep uh, some thought available that you're gonna wanna make sure your evacuation plan is finalized at this point in time. Um, so really quickly, we have some homework for everyone, and that's going that's one of the things that we do in these webinars is provide homework for everyone. We recognize everyone's not at the same uh, part of their journey of fire resilience. So for those of you for whom this is a brand new subject, um, I'm going to give you a call to action to consider doing that thing that you said that you're going to do on the, the Menti Word Cloud. So whether it's raking up uh, back one done, whether it's raking or cleaning out your gutters, go ahead and commit to doing that. Um, if you've already started doing a lot of work, maybe you've already done a lot of these things, go back to that checklist that we just had up. Um, make sure that you finish your yearly maintenance within the first 100 plus feet of your home. And finally, uh, recognize that fire does not stop at your property line. So join us for the next webinar, Building Community for Wildfire Resilience. Um, where we're going to talk about the various ways that people come together as a community, uh, not just in their house. And now